I grew up in a time period of gaming that many consider to be... awkward. The PS2 was all the rage, the Xbox was the new kid on the block, and the GameCube was... well, it was there. Personally, I had the PS2, but that mostly came down to whatever system my dad wanted. If I had my way, I would have been that kid carrying around their GameCube by the handle, showing it off to all the ladies. Anyways... That era was fantastic in many ways, especially on the PS2 front, but for certain series, things went downhill fast. Looking at you, Crash and Spyro! You see, 3D platformers and other games from popular series like these left a lot to be desired for most fans, and I think when most people look back on that era, all they see are a bunch of mediocre mascot titles and licensed games. Even the big Mario title of the generation is extremely divisive. I've heard a lot of debate about this topic lately, and I think that's due to games like Battle for Bikini Bottom being remade, and talk of later Crash games getting the same treatment. Lots of people are just like, why? Games like that back then sucked, right? I don't want to straight up say these people are all just wrong, mostly because, yeah, there were some less than stellar games back then. But personally, I think there were quite a few overlooked gems from those days. Like I said, I was growing up back then and I played some of my favorite games of all time, many of them being licensed trash. If you are subbed to me, it's likely because you saw the video I made last year on Spongebob Revenge of the Flying Dutchman and the company that made it, Big Sky Interactive. So you likely already know I was into obscure licensed games. Nickelodeon games specifically were my jam, but there are others too. In fact, today I wanted to discuss a Disney movie tie-in game that I rarely hear mentioned. But, when it came out, it was actually fairly well received by critics. I know, I was surprised by that as well. This video won't exactly be like my Spongebob video, as I couldn't find much about the game's development or anyone to interview. But I hope you'll enjoy it all the same. And I do have a little bit of a funny story to share with you later in the video. So sit back, relax, and let me take you to the wonderful world of the Hundred Acre Wood. When you think of the world of Winnie the Pooh, Piglet is likely not the first character that comes to mind. At least, he wasn't for me as a kid. He was always the frightened, anxiety-ridden side character, and I didn't pay him much mind. I think the creators at Disney had a similar perception, because in the early 2000s they decided to redeem his character and make him the focus of his own film. Piglet's Big Movie. It was set to release in 2003, and they wanted it to be, well, big. So much so that they tasked the developer of previous Winnie the Pooh games, Doki Denki Studios, with creating a new video game counterpart to coincide with the film. They were a French studio that had previously created fairly decent projects such as Tigger's Honey Hunt, which I also played as a kid and enjoyed. I will say their opening logo always terrified me, but hey! The title they created for the movie would be known as Piglet's Big Game. If you look at the box art, they crossed off the word movie and simply wrote in game which I'm sure they found very clever. The console version of Piglet's Big Game was published by Gotham Games, a subsidiary of Take-Two Interactive, who are still very well known for the games they publish today. I think Piglet's Big Game is probably Gotham Games' most notable release, unless titles such as Austin Powers' Pinball or Door the Explorer's Super Spies tickle your fancy. Unfortunately, Piglet's Big Game, similarly to Revenge of the Flying Dutchman, was Doki Denki's last game before they shut down, and Gotham Games was dissolved shortly after the release as well. There doesn't seem to be much of a story to this one, however, as both shutdowns were pretty standard happenings related to financial issues. It's unclear if there were any major developmental issues when creating this game, but they were able to get it done with little to no glitches on March 18th, 2003, just in time for the movie. Let's take a closer look. Piglet's big game opens on the first day of autumn in the Hundred Acre Wood. Everyone is doing various chores besides Rue, who is playing with his ball, or getting it stuck in a tree. Owl is trying to find his memory book, Rabbit is gathering carrots, Eeyore is being all depressed, Tigger is painting his house, and Pooh Bear is trying to get some of that sweet, tasty honey. Piglet walks past all of them, just kind of enjoying life, until he gets to Tigger's house, when out of a leaf pile appears a Granosaurus. I'm honestly not sure exactly what that is, but it laughs pretty evilly. Piglet becomes terrified and yells the creature's name before running away, scaring Rabbit in the process. 
Tigger turns around to see the monster, but it disappears before he can, leading Tigger to believe that Piglet is afraid of a pile of leaves. Piglet continues to run away in fear, until he bumps into Christopher Robin, who picks him up and consoles him, telling him not to be afraid because nothing is there. He then tells Piglet he needs to face his fears and believe in himself, in order to overcome those fears. Piglet says he is much too small and afraid, and therefore will never be the hero Christopher Robin believes him to be. As Piglet ponders over these thoughts and walks off all alone, Roo and Pooh Bear drift off to sleep, and so begins this adventure. As the game begins, you're placed in an interactive menu, where you can either create a new game with the storybook, or load an existing game with Gopher. This actually brings me to a connection I want to make about my last Spongebob video. That game had an interactive menu too, and at the time, I couldn't think of any other games that I had played that did this. I said in that video that I was sure there were other games that had interactive menus, but that I didn't know of any. Well, obviously I was wrong about that one, because this game has an even more impressive one than Spongebob's, and I've played it many times as a kid, so I'm a bit embarrassed. I was also told by my cousin after I published that video that Crash Bandicoot games did this too, but I never played them growing up, so that didn't cross my mind either. The point is, I apologize for saying stupid things. Once you create a new game, you are put in an area with even more menu options, such as sound, vibration, and screen size. You can also watch the credits and do a bit of a tutorial of sorts by catching frogs and pushing a crate. These are both important mechanics for various challenges later on in the game, so I think it's really clever to include it in the opening area just for fun. I know I spent a good amount of time practicing catching these frogs because I thought something would happen if I got them all. Of course, nothing did happen, but it helped me be able to catch other things later on. Really, this entire menu is sort of a tutorial, because it teaches you how to interact with things, and the effect that has, which is the main thing you'll be doing throughout the rest of the game. When you move on to the next area, you'll find a projector, a bulletin board, and a telescope. At the projector, you can watch short clips of the movie, and at the bulletin board, you can see key cutscenes from the game. You can't watch anything on the bulletin board right away though, as you unlock them as you progress through the game. And there are only three movie clips starting out, you have to unlock the rest of those too. The final option, the telescope, is how you truly begin the game. Interacting with it allows you to start a level. There are six levels in total, and each of them is based on a dream world for the six characters. Pooh, Roo, Owl, Eeyore, Rabbit, and Tigger. If you've seen Piglet's big movie, you will know that the premise of traversing dreams has absolutely nothing to do with the film's plot. It is, however, a more entertaining idea in my opinion. The only real similarities the game has to the movie is that Piglet is the focus, and the themes have to do with Piglet being brave or helpful. Heck, even the movie's present day plot barely features Piglet at all, opting instead to have his friends try to find him, while having flashbacks to times where Piglet did something significant. Like I said, I think the dreams idea is better for a game. So starting out you can pick between Pooh Bear or Roo's dreams. I always choose Pooh's dream to start myself, but it is nice that they give you options. Whenever you start a dream, it will show you a short cutscene that lets you hear what the character is thinking as they dream. Pooh, in particular, is dreaming that he wants honey. Shocker. Then the scene opens to Piglet, rubbing his eyes and a disembodied Pooh voice saying he wishes Piglet were there to help him with his problem. You'll find yourself in a world made entirely out of candy and other sugary foods. The game doesn't immediately tell you what to do next, but that's where exploration comes in. If you wander around, you'll find objects with a circle of lights around it. Pressing the interaction button, X for PlayStation and A for GameCube, will either play a voice clip of the narrator saying something about the item, sometimes giving you a clue, or it could play a cutscene of some sort. The other thing you can do is kick objects in the environment to collect cookies. There is a set number of cookies in each section of the level, and specific objects hold these cookies. The game doesn't tell you which objects hold the cookies, so you'll probably end up kicking everything if you struggle to find the right spot. Once you collect every cookie in a section, Piglet will twirl around and give a celebratory cheer, and the cookie symbol will be crossed out. After you wander around a bit, collecting cookies and such, you will find Owl who will open a gate for you, and tell you that Pooh is just beyond it. This isn't exactly true though, as you still need to walk a ways and push down a wafer bridge to find him. When you do find him, he is sitting in a pile of melted caramel, stuck. Pooh says he was looking for honey when he somehow ended up in this situation, and tells Piglet he may be able to use a stick to get him out. Luckily, there is a huge lollipop stick sitting a few feet away. How 
Convenient! When you pick up objects like the stick, they will be mapped to one of three buttons. In my case, square, triangle, and circle. Then, when you want to use it to deal with a situation, you press the button it's mapped to. After Pooh is out of the caramel, he will tell you that he wants to go find Rabbit in the hopes that he will know where to find some honey. Then, he wanders back to the section of the level you started in. You follow him back and he tells you that to get to Rabbit, you need to get through this wall of cotton candy. Then you go back and forth between interacting with him, this giant bottle, him again, then Owl, and then Pooh again until he finally helps you pull down the handle of the bottle, spraying water on the cotton candy to make it melt. Now that the doorway is open, you can enter the next section, but Piglet is not a fan of what you'll find. Now to introduce you to the game's other big mechanic, the enemies. Heffalumps and Woozles to be exact, this particular Heffalump is obviously the most basic of them all and will die in one shot if you don't mess up. How do you get rid of this monstrosity you may ask? Well, that's pretty simple. You just scare them with scary faces. Okay, let me be more specific. If the enemies spot you, they will be alerted and they will chase you. You'll want to press the interaction button as quickly as possible to enter a battle with plenty of space, so that you'll have more time to attack. If an enemy is too close to you when you start the battle, you will likely lose. If you lose, the enemy will frighten Piglet, and you'll need to run away and find one of these Christopher Robin balloons. Interacting with these will play a cutscene, where Christopher gives Piglet a pep talk. So the more dots in the line, the more time you'll have to spook them. And after you spook them, they will turn into a bottle that you need to collect. But how do you spook them? by entering the button combos on the screen as quickly as possible. This sounds easy, and at first it is, but once you get into the late game, this actually can get pretty difficult. The enemies start to vary with new powers that can drastically change how the button combos work. There's this vampire magician woozle who will duck down at points so that he won't see your scary face if you complete the combo at that moment. This means you'll need to be patient and press the last button when he isn't looking down. There's a tuba heffalump who will erase all your progress if you don't complete the combo fast enough. Then there's a stylus woozle who will flip the orientation of the screen. The list goes on and on. You can't just use the same scary face to stop all these different enemies either, which means you'll need scarier, more powerful faces. This is where the cookies come in. Throughout the game, you will come across these big theater stands with coin slots in the front. You can use these to exchange cookies for a new face, and you'll want to collect all the different faces to really have a chance at beating the game in the end. I always found it fun to see what the next one was going to be, as most of them are goofy and made me smile. One more thing. The more powerful a scary face, the more buttons you'll need to press to complete an attack. It's just something to keep in mind. Once you deal with this first heffalump and collect his bottle, the way to the next area will open. You'll find that you have to face these heffalumps and woozles pretty often to open the way. Upon walking through this door, you'll find a... creepy party room. I know this probably isn't supposed to be creepy, but something about it just really puts me off. Maybe it's the music. So you'll find this lit candle on one of the cakes in this room. And Piglet puts the still lit candle in his sweater. Piglet loves pain. You can use this candle to melt the chocolate door back in the other room. Once you do find Rabbit, he will tell you where to find a pool of honey. But there's a swarm of bees guarding it. After some light puzzle solving, you can get rid of them. But now you need a pot to hold it in. If you go back to Rabbit, he will give you a candy key to open a cabinet in the nightmare room. You take the pot back to the honey well and fill it up. Then after you wander all the way back to where you first found Pooh, fighting woozles along the way, you can finally give the honey pot to Pooh, who will happily devour it, ending the story for the first dream. The rest of the game is fairly similar, but with drastically different environments and end goals. Roo's dream is made out of various craft supplies, and he needs help retrieving his ball. Owl's dream is full of books and other intelligent stereotypes, as well as some surreal vibes. and he needs help getting his memory back. Eeyore's dream takes place in a dreary, haunted estate, complete with a spooky storm, and he needs help returning the color to his black and white mansion. Rabbit's dream is basically just a huge garden with some mines underneath, and Rabbit ingeniously got himself stuck in the ground and needs help fixing the machine to get him out. 
And finally, Tigger's dream is based on the seasons, and you need to help him return his signature black stripes to his person. Each dream has some really beautiful imagery if I'm being honest, and each one is just enjoyable to wander around in. Some of the scenes are very surreal and have some really ominous music for a kid's game. <laughs> but they are all well-crafted and a joy to explore. If I had to pick a favorite, it would either be Pooh or Eeyore's, because I'm a big lover of the Halloween and creepy vibe, but who doesn't love a good candy world? The answer is sociopaths. At the end, after you've completed every dream, there's one last level, the real world. When everyone was asleep, a storm flooded the Hundred Acre Wood. What's worse, each character that you helped in their dreams is now trapped on various islands, and the heffalumps and woozles from the dream world have become real. You'll have to muster all your puzzle solving and button mashing skills to rescue each character, but once you have them all together, the Granosaurus returns. Still don't know what that is. For a final boss, he's kind of a pushover, but you don't have a lot of time to scare him enough, so you'll have to work fast. Once defeated, he vanishes, and all of Piglet's friends thank him profusely, and tell him how brave he was. Christopher Robin returns, and tells Piglet he is very proud of him. Then, together, all the members of the Hundred Acre Wood sit down to have a picnic, and the credits roll. So overall, the game is pretty simple. You collect items to make solutions with simple puzzles, and you collect cookies to buy faces to defeat enemies with button combos. I also failed to mention until now that there are several moments when you play as Tigger or Pooh Bear himself, to complete tasks that Piglet can't get to. When you play as Tigger, you have to sneak around enemies to get to a goal, and when you play as Pooh Bear, you run for your life as you are chased by enemies. Again, simple, but it can be a fun change of pace. The simplicity of the game and its story can definitely make it feel like it's just for kids, so it's not for everyone. But like I said, exploring these dream worlds is a very enjoyable time in my opinion. I will say that the game has its issues though. For instance, the mechanic of collecting cookies can get frustrating and tedious at times, especially because certain sections of dreams are far bigger than others. So you may waste a lot of time kicking things if you can't find the last group of cookies. Not to mention, when you kick these cookies out of their hiding spot, they could fly everywhere, and you only have a few seconds to grab them before they snap back to where they were. This means you'll probably have to kick most things two or three times to get them all, and you need to collect as many as possible to get the different faces, so it's not really something you can just ignore. Ultimately, it's not a terrible mechanic, and it can be a fun scavenger hunt. I just found myself getting annoyed from time to time. Despite the flaws and childishness, it's a game that I still play and enjoy to this day. Yeah, some of that is nostalgia, but I truly believe that this game is well crafted, pretty to look at, and actually somewhat relaxing due to the simplicity and background noises. As I said, it's not for everyone, but if you're a fan of Winnie the Pooh, or looking for something colorful to play without a ton of serious thought, I totally recommend this little gem. As I said at the beginning of this video, critics actually threw a lot of praise towards Piglet's big game, though they do admit it's clearly for children. IGN gave the game both a 6.5 and a 7, I think for the different platforms between PlayStation and GameCube, while certainly not designed for most post-pubescent gamers, Piglet's Big Game is a nice little gem for the younger crowd. And if Winnie the Pooh is your thing, this just might be the best game starring the gang from the Hundred Acre Woods. Developer Doki Denki has done a great job tailoring the game to suit younger players. Gameplay is a little repetitive, but is spiced up with numerous cutscenes and the incentive to unlock cartoon clips. The graphics, meanwhile, are of surprisingly high caliber, detailed and ambitiously animated, and the music and enjoyable voice acting add greatly to the production value. A true kids game, highly recommended for younger gamers and fans of Pooh. If you happen to be over the age of 10 though, this one probably isn't for you, even if it is well executed. GameSpot gave the game a 7, saying things like, It's true that there are lots and lots of poor quality games in virtually any genre, but it seems that the kids' games get the lion's share, as publishers seem to rarely have much respect for the intellect of that particular audience. 
Piglet's Big Game is a wonderful exception to this rule and a good example of how to bring a licensed property and quality production together without compromising either. The big kids might not enjoy playing it, but even a gamer with more mature, refined tastes should be able to appreciate the presentation of Piglet's Big Game. I think most of these opinions reflect my own, though unlike IGN, I do think the game can be enjoyed by some of the older crowd. It's a shame that Doki Denki shut down. From what I did find, it seems they were liquidated after losing a contract with Vivendi for a random racing game. I'm sure that the company could have made more great games, and hopefully the employees found more work elsewhere. Speaking of more games, during the making of this video, I discovered that there is actually a pseudo-sequel to Piglet's Big Game that I never knew about. It's called Winnie the Pooh's Rumbly Tumbly Adventure, and it was developed by a company called Phoenix Studio, and was published by Ubisoft of all companies. Virtually everything about the game is the same mechanics-wise, except that you play as Pooh Bear. I assume that Disney owned the work that Doki Denki used for Piglet's Big Game, and decided to hand it off to another company to make another title faster than otherwise. It is possible that Phoenix Studio is actually an offshoot of Doki Denki, that the previous members of Doki Denki formed after the first company went under, but I couldn't find any concrete evidence of this. The only things that make me wonder is that for one, they are using the work that Doki Denki created, for two, I read that Phoenix Studio is also a French company. And for three, Rumbly Tumbly Adventure appears to be the only game this studio ever made. If anyone knows anything more about this or wants to correct me, let me know in the comments. I don't know how I went all this time without finding out about this game, but hey, better late than never. Well, that's about all the thoughts and information I have on Piglet's Big Game. But before I wrap things up, I did promise you a story. It's a bit embarrassing if I'm being honest. I obviously had this game when I was young, and I enjoyed it a lot, but I wasn't exactly good at games, and like Piglet, I was maybe a bit of a coward as well. So I played through Pooh's Dream for a while, loving the look of all the giant candy around me, and then come to the point where the Heffalumps and Woozles show up, and I was having none of it. I panicked, paused the game, and freaked out to my mother about it. I don't remember exactly how it came to this, but I convinced my mother to do all of the enemy fights for me whenever they showed up. I had never seen my mother hold a controller before that, but she seemed to at least somewhat enjoy playing the game with me. My fear of them only got worse. I mean, I was terrified of these things. Even when I watched the old cartoons and saw one, I freaked out. Well, one afternoon, when I wanted my mom to help me, she was busy or not in the mood, something like that. I tried insisting that she help me, as I was really scared, but she told me I needed to try to do it myself now. I did not like the sound of that, and in a bit of panic, seeing the woozle moving towards Piglet, I didn't pause the game, I tried forcing the controller into her hands, yanking the controller out of the console which caused the game to give an error message. That was the last time my mom helped me with Heffalumps and Woozles, but that was probably for the best. I overcame the fear and eventually got to the last level, though I never beat it. Looking back now, it seems ridiculous and embarrassing, but every once in a while my mom and I will look back on it and laugh. Piglet's Big Game has always been a great childhood memory for me, even with my stupid fears. If you have kids now that are just starting to play games, maybe check it out. You may not have heard much about it, but I promise it's completely worth you or your kids' time. And hey, maybe check out the movie too. You can never go wrong with a trip to the Hundred Acre Wood.